How feasible is it to live on a single income in the current economy? What about raising a child on a single income? These are questions that probably would have been scoffed at just a few years ago. But now it feels like most struggle to make ends meet even with two incomes. So in order to find out, I asked someone who's trying their best to do exactly that. A single father of two children who out of the respect for his privacy will call Dave. And I think the conversation that I had with Dave will highlight some very real challenges that are faced by millions of Americans every single day in this economy, even though according to the data or the Federal Reserve is very strong. So let's get started. To get a good baseline, I asked Dave some very important first questions, like where he lives and how much he makes, because these are important when it comes to standard of living. And Dave told me that he actually makes a small salary plus commission, and that's because he works in sales for a small company based in Austin, Texas. And he told me that because of this, his income does vary, although over the last four years, it's been about $72,000 per year, which to put things into perspective is actually quite good at least when compared to the United States as a whole. The median household income hovers right at about $74,000 per year. And remember, that number takes into account dual incomes. So Dave, by himself, is getting very close to that, which at first glance might seem very good. But Dave also has two daughters, who he adores, and he lives in Austin, Texas, which isn't a very expensive city if compared to other cities like New York, but it is still higher than the national average when it comes to cost of living. And real estate, which is a major cost for everyone, is higher than the national average by about 9%. So naturally, I asked him what his major expenses were. And unfortunately, this is where things start to fall apart for Dave. And it becomes very evident the struggles people similar to Dave who remember earns a very decent wage face in today's economy. Now Dave told me his major expenses were housing, his car payment, and his student loans. He also told me that he wants to give his two daughters the best life he possibly can. And he stresses a lot about the things that they might want to participate in in the future. He says one of his daughters loves dancing and he could see her wanting to take dancing classes as she gets older. She's currently five. And he says his other daughter is already showing a love for sports at the young age of 10. And to him, that means it's only a matter of time that she eventually wants to play a sport, either in or out of school. Now to me, that shows a good parent, but I also understand the stress that it must add. So I continued by asking him how much those major expenses were so we could compare it against income. And this is where we start to see how utterly stacked the cards are against a single earner. Dave told me that he had bought his home together with his wife at the time. He clearly didn't want to elaborate about what caused the split, and I didn't want to ask out of respect. But he did say that he was currently the only owner of that home, and that his monthly mortgage payment was about $2,300, which already, right off the bat, is about 38% of his income before taking into account taxes. Now, I know this sounds crazy to say, but in this real estate environment, his $2,300 payment is actually really good. And it's far below the average new mortgage payment. Just to put it into context, if you purchase the average median priced home today, which is about $384,000 with a 6% interest rate, which is on the low side, and you put 10% down, which most people don't do, you'd be at a whopping $2,679 per month. And that is at a 1% tax rate. Texas has a much higher effective real estate tax rate. So what does this mean? What it means is right off the bat, Dave is already being financially squeezed just from his mortgage. And that it's even worse for the average single earner to try and afford a home. I then asked him to tell me about his car payment and his student loans. Dave told me that he bought a Honda Accord last year. He had a much smaller car, but with the kids getting older, he wanted it to be larger for the extra space and added security. He told me that he sold his old car and used the proceeds of about $5,000 as the down payment. Now, a Honda Accord is a nice ride, but it is by no means splurging. It's a sensible purchase that a sensible person would make. He says he has a 60 month loan on it and is about a year in. And his monthly payment 
is $507, which sounds like a lot because it is a lot, but believe it or not, it's still a couple hundred dollars less than the average payment on a new vehicle, which is a whopping 727 bucks every single month. And that has to do with high interest rates and the fight against inflation. The Federal Reserve still has their federal funds rate at the highest it's been in over two decades, which means that car loans are still insane. With absolute top tier credit, you're still going to be well above 5% on the interest rate. And Dave agrees. He says it's tough and scoffed at the thought that just the roof over his head and his car note, which are basically the bare minimum for a reasonable standard of living, puts his monthly expenses at close to three grand. He says that even with just those two bills, he's eaten through more than 60% of his take-home pay. So in turn, I asked him, after taxes, what was his take-home pay roughly of that $6,000 on average per month? He said, after taxes, about $4,500. The thing is, He's in sales. So while his yearly average is pretty close to $72,000, he said one of the things he's most scared of is simply a bad month. So I asked him what he meant. And he said that this has actually already happened before, that he made less than his base expenses. And he said that month was extremely stressful because in order to make ends meet, he had to rely on a credit card. He said that certain expenses, like his mortgage and his car loan, need to be paid with actual money. So he had to prioritize those first. And he had to fill the gap for groceries and gasoline and just basic living expenses with a credit card. Dave said months like those are where he feels the most vulnerable, like one small misstep or one too many underperforming months in a row and he could lose it all. He said he didn't really care about the material things, but his daughters meant the world to him. And the thought of not being able to provide for them or having to tell them that they wouldn't be able to afford the basics made him visibly distraught. <sighs> the reliance on credit cards is not something that Dave is facing alone. Almost half of Americans rely at some point on their credit cards for essential goods. We're living in a time where credit card debt, which is at an all time high, is not from irresponsible purchases, but instead it's because of people just trying to survive. I then asked Dave to elaborate about his third major expense, his school loans. He proceeded to tell me that he got his degree in business and that while he believes it served him well, he's less sure if it served him well enough to justify the monthly price tag. He says being in sales, he feels like it's given him a leg up, but at the same time, he sometimes thinks that the extra four years of experience, if he had just gone into sales right out of high school, would have maybe taken him just as far. But he says that's a discussion for another life. In this life, his degree costs him about $320 per month, and he'll have that burden well into his early 40s. I asked him what his thoughts were about college. Is it worth it for most? He says he thinks college has its place, but that if you're going to go to college, make sure that it's STEM related. He thinks his degree is kind of in the middle of the pack when it comes to usefulness. And he feels and he hurts for those that spent thousands more than he did on other degrees with not much career prospects. And this is very true. A degree at the end of the day is an investment and it needs to be looked at as such because it is expensive. Now for Dave, those three monthly expenses, his mortgage, his car payment, and his student loans puts his monthly expenses at $3,127. I told him this and he said yes, after those three bills, he has about $1,400 left for the month, $1,373 to be exact. He chuckled, a painful chuckle and said now we have to talk about groceries, gasoline, phone bill, internet bill, car insurance, water bill, electrical bill, and the heating bill. He said groceries and basic necessities alone for his family of three run anywhere from three to $400 every single month. He says he tries to save money where he can by buying in bulk, and he buys off-brand whenever possible when longevity isn't an issue. So I asked him if he's personally seen grocery prices creep up over the last couple of years. He replied, Fuck yeah, they have. They've probably gone up 50% over the last two years, 
he lamented. I then asked him if his salary has kept up, and he said that the product he sells has gotten more expensive. So while his commission split hasn't changed, he has seen a small increase year over year. I asked him if he thought that increase was enough, and he laughed and asked me if I was joking. So I smiled back, and I asked him to elaborate. He said that he's been asking his company time and time again for a raise in his base pay to compensate for the increasing cost of living. And he said they've basically just been stonewalling him. <sighs> I've said many times before, inflation was primarily caused by a ton of money pumped into the economy via stimulus over the last few years. But damn if that doesn't mean that corporations haven't been greedy as hell and continue to be greedy, especially when it comes to increasing wages. But I digress. I asked him what he thinks he's left with for the month after groceries, bills, etc. And Dave told me it wasn't much. Adding up a $400 grocery bill, plus fuel for the car, and phone bill, and internet bill, and insurance for the car, and utilities, he spends about $900 every single month. $927 to be exact. So I did the math real quick and said to him, so you have about $445 after that left for the month. He paused, looked at me, and somberly nodded. And then he proceeded to say, that's before investing, before eating out, before spending any money on both of his daughter's school supplies, or their clothes, or their birthday parties, or before the biggest one of them all setting money aside for their college. Dave says he tries his best to save one to $200 every single month on a college fund for his daughters. He says his biggest dream is to be able to gift both of his daughters a paid for college. He says being able to lift even just that one burden of school loans that he himself is currently having to carry would make him feel like a good father. I immediately told him he's a better father than most. He smiled and he said, maybe, but that is what scares him. He's skirting the line with just a couple hundred bucks every single month. And that's if it's not a bad month work-wise. My biggest fear, Dave told me, is a layoff or a pay cut or an increase in bills because any singular one of those things could tip the finances over. I agreed with him. He's balancing on a very thin beam. And then I asked him the most important question of them all. Is it possible to get by in this economy on a single income for the average American? His answer, no. You have to be an above average earner or you have to truly be single or you have to have help. But for the average person with even just one extra mouth to feed, no.